So um, uh, my name is Rule Schiller, and I'm the uh, Associate Dean for Research here at UC Hastings College of the Law. Um, this format, which as I'll explain to you, I really like, but the one disadvantage of it is it makes my cheat sheet particularly obvious, so I hope you'll forgive me. Um, I I'm here to welcome you to the celebration of the pub publication of Hadar Avaram's book, uh, Cheap on Crime, Recession-Era Politics and the Transformation of American Punishment. Uh, I'm, of course, delighted that, that, that you all can be here. Um, uh, when, when we celebrate the release of a book, um, we usually give the, the, the author a sort of choice of different formats of what exactly we're going to use. And, and Hadar uh, chose my favorite format. Um, we like to call it the fresh air with Terry Gross format, <laughs> um, where we have, a, have a, a little discussion, an informal conversation about the book. Um, so let me introduce the let me introduce the participants. Um, I'll start with our author, who is, of course, our own Professor Hadar Abaram. Um, Hadar has been teaching here at Hastings uh, since 2007. Um, prior to joining the faculty, she practiced as a military defense attorney with the Israeli Defense Forces. Um, uh, she received an MA in criminology from Hebrew University, as well as her PhD um, at UC Berkeley's Jurisprudence and Social Policy Program. Um, uh, Hadar is a prolific scholar. Um, her research focuses on criminal justice system, criminal justice system, criminology, um, examines policing, courtroom practices, and, and broad policy de uh, decisions uh, with respect to criminal justice, and uh, particularly approaching those through empirical and sociological uh, methods. Um, she co-chairs the Hastings uh, Institute for Criminal Justice and runs the, the California Correction Crisis blog. And she is, of course, a, a beloved teacher and, and colleague of ours here at Hastings. Um, to discuss uh, Cheap on Crime with Hadar, uh, we are extremely privileged to have as our, as our Terry Gross um, for the <laughs> afternoon, uh, uh, Jonathan Simon, um, the Adrian A. Cragen <laughs> Professor of Law and the Director of the Center for uh, Law, uh, for the Study of Law and Society um, at UC Berkeley Law School. Um, uh, Jonathan is one of our nation's leading scholars of criminology and criminal justice. Um, he teaches, of course, in that area. Um, he also teaches, um, I don't know, does he teach legal history? He, he practices legal history sometimes. <laughs> um, he also studies law and culture, risk in the law, and sort of socio-legal approaches to law. Um, uh, his publications are too numerous to list, but his prize-winning books include Mass Incarceration on Trial, Poor Discipline, Parole, and Social Control of the Underclass, and Governing Through Crime, How the War on Crime Transformed American Democracy and Created a Culture of Fear. And we're really delighted, Jonathan, to have you join us, so we really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to turn it over to these two for an interesting discussion, and I, I know they'll leave questions for the audience, um, and so I'll let you guys call on folks, and I hope afterwards you'll all uh, join us for refreshments uh, when they're done. So, welcome. Thank you so much, Rule. Uh, let me just uh, well, thank you. Thank you. Thank all of you for uh, joining us this afternoon. So let me just sketch the format for you briefly. I'm going to engage Hadar in a little bit of a conversation about how she came to this book. And then we're going to plunge into the book itself, which is uh, very much a book of this moment and this place and time, uh, California in the, the 2000 teens. Uh, and then we'll, we'll open it up for your thoughts and questions as well. So Hadar, welcome to. Uh, I wish it was fresh air. <laughs> your next stop, may your next stop uh, be, be fresh air. Um, so um, this is an incredibly timely book, and I can't wait to talk with you about the opportunities that this moment offers for, as you say, transformation. Um, but I want to learn a little, in the Terry Gross spirit, I'd like to learn a little bit more about the person who wrote the book, right? Uh, so, and I want to, I'm going to ask you about why you wrote this book, but I first want to ask you about so when did the Hadar Abiram that could become a correctional crisis counselor to the state of California, as it were, uh, emerge? Uh, is that in your education? Is it in your experiences in the Army? Tell us a little bit about that. So my legal education comes from a system that um, is very much like the German system. So there's, there was very little critical thought. There was very little. Uh, there was, it was excellent doctrinal education, but there was very little in the way of looking at things empirically and figuring out how things really work, and very little in the way of social theory and understanding how things work in the real world. So I actually didn't become more acutely aware of all the faults and the problems in the criminal justice system until I started practicing uh, public defense in the Army when I started seeing uh, class differences, ethnicity differences, and how they played out in terms of, uh, of how people fared uh, through the system. 
And after about four and a half years of practice, I began to feel that I was either going to have to somehow live with the fact that I felt that the system was very thoroughly un unjust, or I was going to find some way to look at it critically from the outside, uh, which led me to do my master's in criminology while I was still uh, in the army, while I was still practicing law. And after doing my master's, or I should say during my master's in criminology, we were fed a very steady diet of uh, Marxist social history and critical criminology and radical criminology. And I became very excited. And that's what then led me to, uh, to leave the army and uh, come to Berkeley for my PhD, where I did more work like this on courtrooms. Uh, the interest in prisons actually came later. It came more when I arrived at Hastings. Um, I came here in 2007, and in 2008, um, a few of us who teach criminal procedure got together, and uh, we started talking about conferences that we wanted to uh, put together, and uh, somebody, I think it was Aaron Rappaport, said, we should do something about the California correctional crisis. Yeah, I had just recently arrived uh, back in the States after my postdoc in Israel, and I said, there's a correctional crisis in California. <laughs> and, uh, and then I decided I'm going to start a blog, and that's going to be a good way for me to learn about what's going on. And the first entry of the blog was about how the St. Quentin gym was converted into essentially a dormitory with, uh, with uh, stacked beds. And, and that's, that's, where, that's where it all started. Gradually, the blog got a huge readership. I started getting a lot of emails from people, from uh, correctional officers, inmates, inmates' families, victims, policymakers, and it became its, its, own, its own thing. So one of the great things about being a law professor at this particular moment in history is that there are, you have a lot of outlets for your scholarly creativity and productivity. You can write law review articles. You can write important uh, reports for commissions and NGOs, uh, you can be involved in writing briefs, etc. Um, and you can write uh, scholarly books, but on many, many, many topics, even within criminal justice and corrections, there are many books one could write. So what day, and so what made you wake up one day and decide to write a book called Cheap on Crime? I mean, did this book sort of come to you or did you come to it? I think it actually came through the blog. Uh, as I was recording everything that I saw about California corrections, I started noticing that things were changing. And it was at the very beginning of the process. It was just shortly after the financial crisis hit. And I was getting a lot of my information from newspapers. And gradually, I would hear, I would get small stories. I would get a story about how the DA's office in Contra Costa wasn't going to prosecute people for DUIs anymore because they didn't have money or uh, uh, stories about how police departments were cutting down or how we were treating old and sick inmates, which is a category that was discussed very little, if at all, in the mass incarceration literature up, up to then. And at some point in 2009, after a few months of, of recording things and gradually seeing this coming up, I said, wow, the financial crisis is really changing what is happening here. And then I decided I devoted a tab on the blog to this stuff and started documenting that with special attention. Uh, published a couple of papers on what I was seeing. And at some point, I realized I had enough of this to be a book and that this was not just anecdotal things. Uh, Hadar and I have shared an interest in uh, California's correctional crisis of roughly during this period. I returned to the state from my own exile in, mm -hmm. in 2003 and, and you in 2007. And each of us has a book that's come out this year. Uh, yours has a the word transformation in the title, I think mine mm -hmm. uh, has the word future, at least in it, so mm -hmm. that we're pointing in, in similar directions. I think we both had a sense that we were noticing something that we hadn't noticed before about the penal field, as it were, mm -hmm. and that other people weren't pointing to enough, and yet we're pointing to very different things. So what, dignity and huma inhumanity on the one hand, sort of homonitarianism on the other, and I right. just want to signal that to the audience to let you know we're going to come back to, to, to in a sense, uh, I think some common but also different visions about what is actually transformational about, about this moment. Before we get there, though, uh, one of the things you mentioned, critical Marxist perspectives on criminology, and one of the things I love about your book is that you, you sort of bring back and you extend uh, one of my favorite lines of critical analysis in, in the penal field, and that's Rusha and Kirkheimer's mm -hmm. uh, legendary punishment and social structure, a book that was first published in 1939 and sort of fell into a largely oblivion and then was in some ways largely rediscovered in the 80s after Foucault's Discipline and Punish got people interested in prisons again. And Rusha and Kirkheimer made the proposal that we think about the history of punishment 
in a sense, through the lens of the economy, and in particular, the labor market. And they provided, in a sense, a, a Marxist take on a, an idea that may really go back to Jeremy Bentham, and that is the idea of least eligibility. Many of you will know Bentham's dictum that conditions in prison, or I think the way he put it is the prospects of prison reform, are always constrained by essentially the economic conditions of the lowest uh, classes in free society. So just bef before we kind of get into the specificities of, of your argument, uh, how do you see uh, this wonderful term humanitarianism and, and your analysis of sort of the economic logic of, uh, of the last 10 years or so uh, in light of that, uh, that line of analysis? Is this in a sense an extension of least eligibility analysis? Possibly. It's actually, I see this more as sort of the love child of two uh, knowledge perspectives that never really talk to each other. One of them is this uh, Marxist tradition of Ruch and Kirchheimer, which um, I loved as, as, as a grad student, this idea that uh, punishment basically reflects the mode of production and it reflects what happens in the world economically while it's happening. And, you know, all the people who wrote in this tradition trying to analyze how an increase or a decrease in, in, in unemployment is going to affect uh, levels of punishment, which tends, up, tends uh, not to actually correlate at all with crime rates. It's just sort of the system regulating the, the bottom 50% of 15% of its population or so uh, based on whatever the market, uh, the market suggests. But then I started seeing that um, a lot of the insights that they had about how the economy affects punishment are actually not dissimilar from all the law and econ stuff, all the law and economics literature that talks about uh, uh, how we look at markets and how punishment is a market as well. Now, the Rush and Kirschheimer disciples and the Gary Becker disciples would never, you know, come to the same conferences or have a conversation, and they would have very different ideological perspectives on what should be the proper way to do this, perhaps. I, I don't know. Uh, but the perspectives are actually remarkably similar in the sense that they look at punishment as something that responds or has an interesting conversation with the broader economic uh, structure. So you, you, you introduced a very interesting idea about our penal history, which is that periods of excessive punishment tend to be periods of affluence when there, are, when there is capacity. And, and one period you point to uh, is the 20s, when mm -hmm. we engaged in prohibition and we engaged in sort of a miniature version of mass incarceration. Mm -hmm. I, those of you that are familiar with the, the infamous chart of the American incarceration rate, we always emphasize how flat it is, but in fact, if you look at, there is this little peak in 1939. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I like about your book is that you, uh, notwithstanding the emphasis that many of us have put on the sort of post-1960s mm -hmm. period, you, you take us, and others perhaps extending us all the way back to you know the beginning of European settlement, mm -hmm. you, you see sort of the Great Depression uh, uh, or I should say prohibition and then the uh, downfall of that during the mm -hmm. Great uh, Depression and then today's Great Recession as, uh, as shedding some light on each other. So can you say a little bit more about that? I mean, uh, is this a, a continuation of a phenomenon that America in a sense first experienced or at least experienced in a big way during the roaring 20s when, mm -hmm. when Wall Street and the economy made the country and states very rich? Mm -hmm. So I think many of us try to tell stories of different variations of the story of how mass incarceration came about. And uh, in many books that you and I both know that colleagues of ours uh, wrote tend, as you say, to, to sort of start talking about Nixon as the place at which everything started going wrong and, and starting from the Nixon election campaign. I think that what kind of story you want to tell really dictates when you're going to start the story chronologically. And at some point when I started reading more about the fiscal background to prohibition and to prohibition repeal, it struck me that there were immense similarities to what's going on with the truce on drugs that's happening now, not just in terms of the usual, you can't legislate morality, you can't enforce morality, but also the fiscal forces behind both the criminalization and the decriminalization wave. And I said, this might be an interesting place to, to start the narrative because this is this is basically the first time in which uh, the U.S. federal government says we actually care what happens in the states and in municipalities. We care whether people drink or not, and we're going to invest money and manpower and energy in enforcing this law. Uh, this was not the case before. Now, it's interesting that when I talk to historian friends of mine about the book, they usually say, well, you could have started in 1874, which apparently was also a financial crisis, and check what happened with, uh, with prison rates then. And, you, and 
that just makes my mind explode with possibilities with the question of whether it's just that we're just going through cycles all the time. We'll be punitive for 30 years and then non-punitive for 30 years and then it just comes and goes. But I think I'm not a historian, I'm a social scientist and, and, and for, for my purposes, I think that uh, prohibition was a good enough time to start because this is something that uh, could be explained not only politically, not only morally, although all of those explanations are valid, but also, which, uh, which is something people uh, have paid less attention to, also fiscally. Uh, what uh, they were trying to get out of prohibition fiscally and why they brought it back, which was very, very similar to what we're doing with marijuana now, was the immense expenditure of, uh, of enforcing this law, the huge underground economy that it creates, and the immense revenue potential of uh, legalizing it and just putting it out there in the legal market. So, so the similarities were really striking and that's why I, I, I chose to start the story there. I think a lot of it is also inspired by your book, by Governing Through Crime, that goes into the 20s and 30s, not so much through the fiscal perspective, more through the political perspective, but there were lots of interesting things there that haven't been explored by our colleagues who start looking at things in the 60s. I think you, what you've really uh, helped us focus on is that, you know, it's so easy to talk about America as if we were a normal state. But because we have such a peculiar constitution, our fiscal structure is a very bizarre one. And so to, to, to think about how waves of policy move through America without thinking about the, the fiscal channels, which is, in fact, how most of us in criminology write about it, mm -hmm. and perhaps until this book, uh, it, it, in many ways, you know, really hides that ball. And it's a very, very important ball. Now... I, you know, I think the most important part of your, about your book and the, the introduction of this notion of humanitarianism is how it can help us talk about transformation and, and our opportunity now to transform. And I want to get to that and spend the bulk of our time on that. But I, before I do, because you do spend time, and one of the reasons that this book can be well recommended to students is that it really provides a synthetic summary of sort of many perspectives on how we got to mass incarceration mm -hmm. and does not attempt to say I, you know, I, Hadar Abiram, is the first person to ever notice this topic. And it's a very scholarly and, and helpful book in that regard. And I just want to get a sense of, because we've had so many powerful books in, in recent time uh, that have, in a sense, put a new mark on how we understand mass incarceration. Uh, most notably recently, Michelle Alexander's The New mm -hmm. Jim Crow. In a very forceful way, Michelle argues in her book that we need to think about mass incarceration not primarily as a system of crime control, but as a system of racially based social control. Mm -hmm. And and you, you know, account, you, you, you describe many of these same racial dynamics. And so I'd love to just hear for a moment uh, sort of how you see your account dovetailing with uh, Michelle's account and other accounts. Are these sort of two story, two different stories about mass incarceration or are they part of one story? It's Whenever I read books about mass incarceration and, and you know, the, the classic ones that we like are always come up, uh, come to mind, you know, Vanessa Barker's The Politics of Imprisonment, Michelle's book, um, uh, Marie Gottschalk's book, The Prison and the Gallows. Whenever I read this, I think that we're all like the, those blind men from the fable trying to fill the elephant, feel the elephant and trying to figure out what kind of an animal it is. So each of us is grabbing something. The person who's grabbing the leg of the elephant says, well, the elephant is a big column. The person who grabs the trunk says, well, the elephant is like this big flexible tube. Everybody feels a different part of it. I don't think that some stories are truer than others. Uh, I think that some stories tell more of a top-down story, mostly accusing the Nixon administration of fueling fear. Uh, some of these books tell the story of the silence of the left in, in light of everything that was happening. Some of them tell a more federal story, more national story. Some of them tell a more local story, focusing on the different political uh, structures of different states and how they facilitated more or less punitive practices. And... And, and I say in the book that this account is not meant to supplant any of those accounts. It's just, I think that what you get from looking at things through historical materialism or through the money perspective is it kind of tells you where people's heart is if they're willing to put their money there. And one of the things uh, that, I, that I'm realizing as I'm working through this is that uh, the Nixon administration was the first administration in which the federal government was actively engaged in the business of funneling large sums of money into municipalities and local governments and local police stations, really meaning to make this change on the local level. And to me, this, this tells me a story about how committed they were 
to this big project of crime control. What I'm not seeing, and I think this is the interesting thing, and, and this is where perhaps Michelle Alexander and I differ, is I'm not seeing that money invested in uh, in the others on the other side of the criminal process. So all the investment goes into policing and arresting, and none of the money goes into prison building, none of the federal money. Which means, of course, since the police becomes more efficient and more powerful, more people get arrested and more people get convicted, and then the states get stuck with the question of what are we going to do with these people? We have to build, but the feds are not going to help us with that. And so the states have to scramble to get the money to build this whole infrastructure of prisons to fill it in with all those people that are that are coming in. So, so I think that if there's a conspiracy theory here, it's not so much that the, the, the mass incarceration project was intended. I think it was more the front end of it, the sort of the public safety piece of it that was very intended and very deliberate based on how the money flowed. And the rest of it was kind of an afterthought that, that the federal government didn't really invest anything in and the states had to sort of resolve somehow. In some ways, though, I think that's even more scary to me than some sort of arch villain, you know, kind of sitting there and thinking, ah, we'll put all of these, all of these folks in prison. It's more scary that they didn't even consider that there were all these people. Now, you know, 2.3 million people and there would be nowhere to put them and there would be no humane conditions in any of these places and who was going to work in these places and many of the horrors that you document in, in, uh, in mass incarceration on trial. That, that I think in some ways just the neglect and the lack of thought and all the weird financial mechanisms that they created to make this happen, this scares me a lot more than deliberate evil. So let's start talking about transformation now because I've been, although it's just one word in your title, it's the word that at least speaks to, to, to me the most and I think there is a sense that many of us have that you're at least somewhat confirmatory to that indeed we are at a moment when there really is a possibility of changing this really awful pattern that we've been on for a long time. And it's, you know, one of the frustrating things you come to grapple with in your fifth or sixth decade is that, you know, every year, every month is not as open as every other one mm -hmm. to changing things. Some things, a door opens and then it's not open again for decades. And it certainly feels like a door is open here. And one of the things that I think you've highlighted in this book is the role that the Great Recession as a historical event, largely because of its enormous impact on local and state budgets, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. has really been a reset moment um, for this current political environment. And I really want to explore with you sort of what the opportunities are for a, a fundamental transformation of mass incarceration. So we all know that the transformation that we get is probably not going to be as good as the one we want or as big as the one we want. So I guess I suppose it, one question to ask is, in, in thinking about sort of what's new here, we've been thinking for a while now that sort of our mass incarceration is generally related to this phenomenon, neoliberalism. Mm -hmm. uh, and for many people, neoliberalism is the dominance of market logics and economic logics over all kinds of social policy. So is sort of humanitarianism just another breakthrough for neoliberalism? Or can we expect, is it a representing a kind of a contradiction within neoliberalism? Or how do you read it? In that it's, I think it's actually both. I think that, so part of this is that this isn't really any break from neoliberalism. This is basically we're just still doing neoliberalism. We're just, we just have less money to do it. So, so it, becomes, it becomes cheaper. So that may be one way of looking at it, which is less transformatory, perhaps. The other one is to look at the way that different players after the recession are trying to use this discourse to get to where they want. I think, for example, that uh, the way that organizations uh, and advocates and activists on the left have sort of leapt on this logic of savings and recessionary thinking and being uh, more prudent and more austere with expenditures on, on, uh, on mass incarceration and on corrections and criminal justice, this is sort of a new argument for them, and it's moved them, moved them away from being frozen in this moment of making arguments that I actually personally feel more comfortable with, which is you can't treat people like herds of buffalo and pack them up as sardines and expect crime to go down. Uh, so, so those arguments perhaps make more sense to me, or I feel more comfortable with them ideologically, but I think that there's been this moment where people seized on the fact that here is something that we can all understand we can all talk about money and about the fact that we all have less money than we used to. And this is something that we'll be able to use to get through to the other side. 
And then you're seeing a similar thing happening on the other side. You're seeing the emergence of uh, Right on Crime, which is a right-wing think tank that's dedicated to shrinking the criminal justice apparatus and ending the war on drugs from a perspective of neoliberal, you know, libertarian, small government uh, folks who, who believe that, you know, this is just too costly, not so much because they feel for the people that are caught in the trenches of this. And, and these two ideologies are finding enough common ground that we're seeing all of these bipartisan bills coming up. We're seeing all these changes happening in the war on drugs on the federal level. We're seeing all these changes in the local level. And, and this is really moving things forward in a way that was impossible when we were locked in the uh, public safety tough on crime versus bleeding hearts soft on crime paradigm. This is something that may seem shallow or it may be dirty to talk about money, but it's at least a common ground that everybody can talk about and understand each other. And it allows uh, folks that would previously be, uh, this is something that I actually remember from governing from, through crime and I always quote you, uh, when you said, it doesn't really matter if you're a Republican or a Democrat or what shade of politician you are, you can't afford to be soft on crime. It's just not something you can do. Now, you sort of can. If you present yourself as somebody who is, you know, a decent person who cares about financial accountability and, and doesn't want these crazy expenditures. And, and that is something that you can politically sell and people do get elected and get respect on, on that platform. Well, one way of thinking about it, I suppose, it reminds me of an argument Dan Kahan made a number of years ago about deterrence, that it forms a kind of neutral ground that in which people with very different value systems about criminal law can sort of pretend to have a common framework. Mm -hmm. uh, and perhaps economics is doing that. As someone who sort of lived through in America the crime wave and then the mass incarceration wave, it, seems kind of, it, it still seems really surprising to me in a way that that it works, that is that economic talk can take hold in an area in which people have invested so much emotion, beginning with fear. So do, should we attribute a fair amount of this to the crime decline or to the aging out of the population that was most traumatized by the, the original crime wave? So I've thought a lot about the decline in crime and how that might contribute to some of this. My sense from, from what I read about people's perceptions of levels of crime is that people notice when crime goes up, but they don't really pay attention when crime goes down. What I do think is that none of this would have worked as well as it does had crime levels still been uh, rising. And, and this is something that you actually see in some of the California decisions. In the Plata decision, there's a lot of this conversation of how is this going to affect public safety if we let you know, 30,000 people go to jails and let them perhaps out you know, early. Uh, whether or not there's early releases is really open to, to debate or interpretation. But, but the conversation there relied a lot on this idea that, well, actually, we're not seeing a huge rise in crime, so we're not freaked out about it. I think that had they seen something of the sort that was happening in the 60s, and again, we can argue about whether people were aware in the 60s that crime was rising. I think, I think they were, much as you know, the more radicals of us would want to believe that everything was fine until Nixon convinced us that it wasn't. We're just not seeing that happening, and I think that's part of what's going on. Now, with regard to the aging of the population, I think there is a younger population that also has a lot of good reasons to be traumatized and angry and upset for a slightly different iteration of pretty much the same social processes here that have to do with race and class and domination and all of that. So I don't know that that's necessarily what's going on. I think what's going on is that None of these things are severe enough to disrupt the money talk because when 2008 rolled around, the talk about the crisis just eclipsed any other social or political conversation in America. I mean, one of the things that was astonishing to me, I started looking at all, the, and, and this is in, in, in chapter five of the book, I looked up all the presidential campaigns uh, since Nixon. The Obama campaign is the first campaign where the crime issue, and especially drugs, were not mentioned at all. The whole conversation is about the economy and about health care and about jobs, and nobody even cares about drugs. Nobody cares about the death penalty. You know, there's, it, it just doesn't come up at all. Nobody cares about it, but it's noteworthy that Obama's, you know, hasn't evolved yet on the death penalty the way he has on same-sex marriage, for instance, and that he <laughs> waited till after the election to, to make any moves, even on the war on drugs. So it's always looked to me a little bit more like a tense standoff than, than a, mm -hmm. uh, really an abandonment of the field, but you're certainly... Right. So let's let's talk a little bit about I mean, one of the great things about the book is you you look across and it's not just about incarceration. It's also about the death penalty and really the whole agenda, the punitiveness agenda. And um, 
if I could point to one term that is kind of a pivot, perhaps, within which this humanitarian discourse is offering us an opportunity to maybe move away from the death penalty and mass incarceration. It's this phrase, smart on crime, mm -hmm. which you, mm -hmm. you analyze in, in some detail, and which, of course, our attorney general, has uh, Kamala Harris, has made the title of a book. Um, do you like the slogan, smart on crime, as somebody, uh, do you think it's something, a, a slogan that can, well, let me put it more positively, how far can that slogan take us mm -hmm. if our goal is to abolish the death penalty and really end mass incarceration, mm -hmm. really roll back mass incarceration? I think as a pragmatist, I like every slogan that changes the direction of how things, how things were going. And this is, while I was writing the book, I was constantly going back and forth about how optimistic the conclusion was going to be. Because part of me, I, I come from, from a culture where it's a little bit uh, less uh, acceptable to be nickeling and diming everything. Although, you know, now that's no longer the case, but it used to be when I was growing up. And, and so I was, I was going back and forth between this is actually crass and shallow and we don't think about human rights anymore, and between, well, but this is the only thing that's making a difference. We haven't been able to make a difference for 40 years, and all of a sudden there's all this change. I mean, since the financial crisis, seven states have abolished the death penalty. This is, if you look at the, if you look at the, the numbers, it's, it's, it's really astounding. And most of those campaigns, if not all of them, were based primarily on issues of cost. And I think that to some extent, this is because more people like our attorney general and other folks were willing to embrace a different terminology for this and dress things up as this is austere, this makes sense, this uh, retains public safety but improves in other ways. And, and it's just, I think the, the magic of this is just that it's fresh, that it gets away from the, the sort of the classic debate. But how far can it go? So in, in the safe, which is the proposition that was narrowly defeated on the mm -hmm. death penalty in 2012. Mm -hmm. um, many critics have pointed out um, it seemed to be, first of all, it sort of epitomizes the humanitarian moment as you describe it, right? This is a proposition that mm -hmm. avoided any direct kind of human rights discourse about mm -hmm. the death penalty, avoided really focusing on the, the victims of the death penalty mm -hmm. as a sort of center of concern. It was much more focused on, as you put it, you know, the waste of money, the fact that executions aren't happening, the fact that we could do more to fight homicide with resources on police. Other, but critics point out that even if it had passed, it would have left us with life without parole as the, uh, the permanent, presumably constitutional sure. punishment for mm -hmm. capital murder would have, uh, and presumably without any resources to then attack mm -hmm. that because if the goal was being smart, that, that, that was offered as the, right. smart, the smart alternative. When we look at the, uh, the imprisonment story, the smart on crime line seems like it can be very helpful when it comes to the war on drugs, uh, when it comes to some very uh, aging offenders, etc. Mm -hmm. What about when we look at sort of the problem of violent crime in prison, people serving long sentences? There, the public right now at least doesn't right. seem to be that unhappy about spending a lot of money to keep people locked up. So do you think there are sort of inevitable uh, limits that we're going to reach uh, in the humanitarian effort to sort of roll back mass incarceration? Absolutely. I mean, the, the book is actually pretty ambivalent about the, the potential of, of this discourse. I mean, some of this is optimistic. I think that uh, the story of the death penalty is looking pretty good. And I actually, after I recovered from the appeal in Jones versus Chappelle, and I haven't given up yet that, that you know, that might, uh, that might work, uh, po possibly because public opinion is changing the more people learn about the costs and, and all that. I've come to the conclusion that the death penalty is probably going to basically die in prison like its victims. It's not going to be one federal decision that's going to make it go away. But I think the cost thing has really made a dent in it. I think that there are some areas of criminal justice that are more permeable to this discourse than others. Uh, some aspects of mass incarceration are more permeable to it. And the classic example is exactly what you're pointing out, that the energy toward releasing people, early releases, and finding all sorts of other uh, ways to deal with them is focused on the folks that we perceive to be very separate from the violent offenders, all the nonviolent, non-serious, non-sexual offenders. And we're all about, let's release these folks because it's minimal risk while retrenching as, 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 and I think that we and I agree about this, retrenching this idea that if you're a violent offender, you know, you absolutely must remain in prison. I thought while I was writing the book that the last bastion of, of belief in mass incarceration was going to be sex offenders because, you know, who's going to defend their interests? The sex offender lobby? I mean, it's really not going to happen. And then I started hearing conversations about the use of electronic monitoring. 
which granted has a lot of problems, you know, thinking about the whole surveillance system there and the lack of distinction between different types of sex offenders, still better than prison. And uh, I remember ha talking to a friend who uh, was writing an amicus brief for the, for the ACLU of Massachusetts, because apparently the, 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 uh, the electronic monitoring thing is very painful to carry and it creates all these injuries on people's legs and what to do about it. And I was already deep uh, writing on cheap on crime, so I was already kind of a Keynesian you know, market person. And I said, instead of doing all this, why don't you just get a bunch of startup people you know, in Boston, come up with a light plastic one and you know, do a Kickstarter and, and just fix it that way. And, and I, so, so after we had that conversation and after they started talking about this, I realized they have found a way to economize even on these people about which I thought there could be no compromises. But it's true that a lot of this stuff is not permeable to the cost discourse, and that at least with regard to some sacred things like you know really, really violent people, or, or not even really violent people, just folks who are doing time for violent offenses, it's going to be more difficult to sell. But, but the same basic discourse could be applicable. That is, we can go to people and say, ultimately, do you really want to spend what it's going to take to keep this person in prison for 40 years if they're... Uh, very unlikely in the last 20 years of that period to commit mm -hmm. any crimes. And we can show you that violent criminals have similar life course patterns as non-violent right. criminals. Right. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm starting to think, you know, reflecting on this and talking to people that have read the book since it came out, I'm starting to think that the whole emergence of life course criminology is a big deal. All this energy devoted to when do people desist from crime and when do people grow out of crime feeds directly into this. The problem is that very often when you try to sell this discourse, people just don't believe your data. There are still people that I talk to about the death penalty. I show them the numbers from the California legislative analysts, and they don't believe me that life without parole is cheaper. They just, they just don't want to believe the numbers. Not that it should come as any surprise to any of us that you present people with facts and they don't believe you. But, uh, but, uh, but, but I think if you manage to present the argument in a plausible, reasonable manner, it actually has... It has the potential to change minds. So here's an astonishing thing. As part of the research for the book, and because I believed in it, I, I worked a lot on the Prop 34 campaign, and I was devastated when, when it didn't pass. Uh, but one of the things that I did was I was captain of a group of people that were distributing flyers for Prop 34. Uh, we worked all sorts of places. We worked festivals. We worked the Folsom Fair. It, it, it was, I was everywhere with, with these folks. And, and I had lots of interesting conversations with the volunteers. And I thought that if somebody gets up on a Sunday morning, early in the morning, to distribute flyers, they really care about the death penalty, right? They're like hardcore abolitionists. And I talk to people, and the other volunteers tell me, I'm actually kind of on the fence about the death penalty. I don't really care, but I do care about the $130 million. So this was enough not only to change people's votes, but to get people to distribute flyers. Well, that's a great story because I really I would have wondered whether you know the activists have to be people who are morally engaged, but you seem to suggest maybe not. So let me before I open it up. I mean, you kind of pick a fight with me at the end of the book uh, about <laughs> dignity versus money, right? And and this is an old debate within criminal justice reform. Should we appeal to people based on the inhumanity? Oh, the inhumanity. Or should we appeal to people based on their penuriousness? This is too expensive, right? Mm -hmm. and, and yet, when we look at the actual history, uh, we often find that people are doing both. So I wonder if maybe we're maybe strategically debating, but um, but playing a common role. So go back to Beccaria, who offers both human rightsy arguments in his book, but also kind of what you might think of today as sort of behavioral economics arguments for why right. the death penalty is, is, a, is a bad idea. And I find myself wondering today whether the sort of humanity argument that I'm making and the money argument that you're making don't really kind of work together in a kind of sort of the way some cancer drugs now do to sort of mm -hmm. hit the phenomena from both directions and try to put it into some kind of death spiral, right? So if, right. if you can, if you're in a world in which dignity doesn't matter, like California's prisons before Plata, then it's not clear how the, the humanitarian pressure is going to be felt, right? Because the state could just keep packing more people in there. It's only when there's some humanity limit to what you mm -hmm. can do that the cost then becomes incredibly decisive. And you know, I'm struck that when you look at people as through the lens of humanity and, and de kind of uh, demonize them and see them as human beings again, then you can also ask kind of cost-benefit questions about them. Right. They're no longer Hannibal Lecter. They're no longer worth mm -hmm. spending endless amounts mm -hmm. of money to control. So 
I, I, I'm going to be dialectic about the fight that I'm picking with you. I, I think I think the fight is interesting, which is why it's it's worth picking. We always, whenever we whenever we show up at panels, we joke that uh, Jonathan is Durkheim and I'm Marx. So he's like talking about solidarity and let's appeal to you know the goodness in people. And I'm like, let's talk about money. So 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 I think I think I think the fight is is. It's, it, I think it's a worthwhile fight to pick, and and I think for for some reasons I think that um, a lot of the a lot of the human rights arguments is the left talking to the people that are already convinced so that we can feel good about ourselves about the fact that yes we all believe that this is wrong but we're not really getting through to the people on the other side the more society becomes polarized and, and fractured rule may remember our conversations about daniel rogers it's more and more difficult to actually find common ground with other people and that is something that even if we get to feel that we're authentic and we're true to ourselves and we really are fighting the good fight it's not making headway I think that both things are effective in the sense that they target different populations and they make different types of appeals. And, and in that sense, they're both, uh, they're both valuable. I think that, here's, so here's, here's the thing, here's the thing. The money argument is not necessarily a shallow argument. And this basically follows what you were saying. It's not necessarily something different than the human rights argument. In a way, I, I talk about, um, about old and sick inmates which are also the folks that you talk about in, in mass incarceration on trial. And I talk about the fact that we've sort of moved away from just talking about how dangerous people are to talking about a cost-risk equation. And in a way, in America, we quantify everything. I mean, think about just, you know, thinking about just, just something that happened yesterday on Facebook. Uh, our, our colleague, uh, Dorit Rice, who's very active uh, writing about vaccines and about the, the recent anti-vax controversies with the measles outbreak and all that, came up with this idea that we should tax the parents that refuse to vaccinate. And that, we, we had a whole discussion on my wall because I pulled that out because I wanted to brag that Dorit was my colleague and that, you know, and this was a good idea and because I think that it's a really interesting and, and, and powerful uh, idea. And people were saying, well, this is horrible because people are just going to pay the tax and it's going to give them this license to, to not vaccinate. And I was saying, well, we know that the folks that aren't vaccinating are not permeable to any scientific argument. They don't care about the impact of the non-vaccination on the rest of the community. The only way you can reach another human being with whom you have such profound dis disagreement is, is through their wallet. But in a way, by saying that, you're also saying your choice is something that is so reprehensible that the government wants to create a disincentive and divert you from that. And in a way, you can look at the money argument as being not shallow by saying, well, by saying we don't want to spend on the death penalty or we don't want to spend on, on marijuana arrests, what you are saying is, I want to spend on health care. I want to spend on roads. I want to spend on education. I want to move this money to avenues of expenditures that are more productive and more effective. I think that's actually a pretty profound statement to make, even though it's made through this discourse through which we talk about everything, which is how much it costs. So in a sense, there's not a lot of, there's not a lot of contradiction. I mean, I'm thinking about one classic struggle that I think is more in the sort of in the dignity department than in the money department, and that's our struggle to end solitary confinement uh, in California and nationwide. Now, the struggle against solitary confinement is very much an old school human rights struggle. This is torture. This is terrible. The conditions are unbelievable. And it's been making a lot of headway by presenting people with, uh, with, uh, with the evidence. But you actually see that some states are coming around to uh, uh, decreasing the reliance on solitary confinement once they realize how expensive it is to maintain a shoe with all the surveillance, with all the security stuff that's going on, with all the guards that have to monitor this going on, with all the health care that ensues from keeping somebody locked up for 23 hours. I don't think that saying this is expensive is necessarily this shallow thing that contradicts the dignity argument. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is, what kind of a society are we that we're willing to spend money on something like this? So, so, so I don't think they're contradictory. I think they actually <laughs> dovetail pretty nicely. When, when, in the end, when we come back and thinking, thinking about the rise of mass incarceration, we may find ourselves asking, how did America sort of become so, you know, divert so radically from both its cheapness and its historically limited commitment to dignity, but at least some commitment to dignity in this period. So without further ado, let me open it up to some of your thoughts and questions. So right over here. Hi. 
Hi, uh, this is great. I'm really excited. I'm looking forward to reading the book. I had a couple of questions about some of the early uh, descriptions of the research. One is that um, you indicated that um, that there's you noticed that there was this trend uh, towards the rise in affluence uh, uh, being mirrored in uh, the the increasing incarceration. And I was wondering whether you did some research also on the rise of inequality inequality, because that was at its peak in the 1920s as well as now. And so did you track it against any Gini coefficients or other measures of inequality? So that's the first question. And then the second question relates to a historical uh, perspective on, um, on prohibition. Like, it's my understanding that the temperance movement and pro the move towards prohibition had been in place for a very long time, but that it's only after the advent of the income tax mm -hmm. did we shift away from having to rely on excise taxes on alcohol. And so it was actually this, this huge uh, federal move in how we finance federal, federal government that made it possible mm -hmm. for even a, for us to move to prohibition. Absolutely. And so can you talk about those things? Sure. So I'll start with the second one. I, I think I think you're absolutely right. Uh, one of the things to understand about the, the, the sort of the coalition to to put prohibition in place and later the coalition to repeal it is that just like today's sort of humanitarian coalitions between the right and the left about savings, it was a very tentative coalition with very different people that wanted very different things. It was the feminists wanting men to stop drinking so that there would be less domestic violence. And it was racists who you know, thought that the populations that were drinking were the populations that were going to target. So, so this was a very uneasy marriage between people that had very, very different interests. Uh, but the taxation thing was definitely there and might have helped push things. And it's absolutely the shift to income tax that made it an easier move to digest. This is this is a uh, post. Uh, I think I think sort of in the, toward the end, toward the twilight of World War One. So so this was this was very much uh, something that was there. And this was also what was going on in repeal. So in repeal, the idea was that the, at that point, the tax structure is, had shifted enough. And the, the, the revenue from income tax had shifted enough that they said, no, we can actually, this can actually be a real contribution uh, to, uh, to our revenue. So, so and, and that's actually covered pretty extensively in, in chapter two of the book, that I think that this is definitely a big part of what was going on. Compare this to the advertising of today's marijuana uh, bills. So the book came out, I, I finished the book before the two last legalizations, so I'm only covering Washington and Colorado in the book. But I do cover the, the campaign in Washington and Colorado pretty extensively. And one of the things that I do in the book is I look at the ads that, uh, that the states were running. So in one of the ads, uh, you see this uh, soccer mom sitting in a little Starbucks-type place. She has this little white mug and a string of pearls, and she has this like nice bob cut. And she looks at the camera and smiles a nice smile and says, I don't like this any more than you do, but wouldn't it be nice if we could make money off of this, if we could tax it, if we could have more money for our children rather than funneling it into, into the gangs? And, you know, she does all of this really quietly. There's like this nice, you know, steam coming off the cup of coffee. Uh, I, I'm sure it was a latte. So, so I'm seeing a lot of similarities between the, the sort of the argumentation there and the argumentation in prohibition. Um, and, and she is definitely there to talk to people like her, not to talk to people like me who think that it's a travesty to criminalize people for this to begin with, because she doesn't like it. She, and so, so in that sense, there's a similarity. With regard to the inequalities question, this is not work that I've done, but this is work that other people have done. And actually, one of the things that comes out of uh, Marxist social history is this idea that um, inequalities actually polarize society to the point that it's easier to oppress the weak. And that tends to yield that sort of situation. This is why uh, Ruth and Kirschheimer predict, and, and people who have written in that tradition sort of join that argument, that um, the more unemployment you have, the more oppressive the criminal justice system is going to be because there's all these people doing nothing who knows what they're up to let's let's crack down on them what i find in the book is actually that they're right and that the economists that say we can only punish as much as we can afford are also right and in a way the economy is shifting from targeting people who are pretty miserable to targeting people who are even more miserable than them so for example private prison companies who are seeing less money in incarceration are going through a really interesting uh, market move right now. It, so one thing they're doing is they're compromising. We're, we're one of their best clients here in California. 
even though presumably there's no institutions here in California, we're shipping our inmates elsewhere to be in, in private institutions. Um, so, so, so they're cutting us a deal. They're saying, you know, it's hard times. You're not incarcerating as many people as you as you would. So we're going to give you a discount on the occupancy rates. You don't have to have, you know, 95% occupancy. You can have 90%. So they're giving discounts. Whatever it is that they lose on that to cut their losses, they've shifted to the market of undocumented immigrants, which is more of a booming market right now. So they've gotten into the business of detention centers and things like that, which dovetails exactly with this idea of let's target people who are even lower on the sort of on the social ladder and, and sort of focus our op oppressive energy uh, toward them because the market is still good with regard to those folks. Right over here. Yes. Hi, thank you very much. I'm, I'm from the Netherlands, so it's very interesting to hear the marijuana argument uh, mm -hmm. being made here, whereas we are getting tougher on marijuana, actually. Mm -hmm. um, but, but I actually wanted to follow up on that, uh, that, that thing you mentioned with the privatization of, of, uh, of prisons. That's something from a European perspective is quite um, American and, and, and very um, different. I was, I was wondering all throughout your talk, um, the business interests indeed. It's very interesting to hear that they are shifting then to, to the irregular migrants, um, the people that are even worse off. Um, I was just wondering, aren't they pushing back as well? Do you also see a movement where this privatization may be sort of turned around, where they say it's actually more costly to use these private companies? Mm -hmm. They have an interest. And how are they trying to fight that other than by giving a rebate? You know, it's, this, is, this is really interesting. And I want to say something about private prison companies that sort of my, my good friends in the left always feel a little bit uncomfortable when I say this. But I, I just have come to the conclusion that this is true. At this point in time, I don't consider private prison companies to be the drivers of mass incarceration. I, I developed this a little bit in the book, but more in later publications. I've come to the conclusion that now everything is privatized. Even public prisons are public only by name. Everything inside is privatized. The food, the health care, you know, even the security sometimes is privatized. So, and everybody is a market agent. Regardless of whether you're a private prison company or a public incarcerator or Everybody's wheeling and dealing pretty much in the same fashion, and all the market actors are responding to the, same, to the same pressures. So in that respect, I don't see a lot of difference between the two. But I have seen something really interesting. I was, uh, when I was starting to work on cheap and crime, I was on sabbatical in Hawaii. So my, life is, my life is too hard to bear sometimes. <laughs> and and I, I lived in Honolulu, and I, I worked at, at University of Hawaii, and I had a lot of conversations with colleagues there because Hawaii houses about half of its inmates off the island. They, they only have one correctional facility, Oahu Correctional Facility, on the main island. Everybody else is doing time in Kentucky and, and, in, and in other places. Now, the institutions there are horrific. They're not really built for folks who come. Uh, it probably wouldn't surprise you guys that uh, the, the, uh, the prison inmate population in Hawaii is disproportionately Native Hawaiians which are folks that really need to be next to water. They've grown on an island their whole lives. They need to be close to their families. This is just such an inane way to incarcerate these people that it's just difficult to explain. And they were doing this because the concept of building more prisons of the island was perceived to be very expensive. And I came to Hawaii and I started talking about this cheap on crime idea. We didn't call it cheap on crime at the time. We called it humanitarianism. I, I'm told by my publisher that was too gimmicky. So we changed the title. Uh, but, uh, but I was talking about this idea with friends. And it turned out that afterwards, somebody actually did the fiscal check. Somebody actually checked the numbers and found out that it wasn't necessarily cheaper. That it might all the expenditures involved in housing the people off the island and all the horrible guard behavior and sexual abuse and violence that these people were subjected to in these institutions and flying them back and forth. All of that stuff was really not worth it, actually, and they might have done better had they kept them on the island. Since then, because of all sorts of idiosyncrasies of Hawaiian politics, they haven't been able to bring them back. There's been talk of bringing them back since 2011, precisely because of this calculus. And, and I'm, I'm with uh, the prison, the, the, the anti-prison activists that I was polling with in Hawaii, uh, they would argue this, and they would sort of argue it with a certain degree of disgust. Because Hawaii is a state that really values this idea of mutual responsibility and caring about our people even when they're doing time for crime. It's also not a state that has very high crime levels and never has. So there's a lot more solidarity with the inmates. And there's more this perception of, you know, let us punish these people as we see fit and bring them back into the Hawaiian family. 
So, so, and that was more important to them than making the money argument, but they realized that the money argument was what was really going to bring these people home. Again, that said, it's already 2015, and from what I understand, they haven't brought the inmates home yet, so I don't know what's going to happen. Yes, please, in the back. So, <laughs> you hear from people who are actually for the death penalty, this really draconian response that the answer to the economic issue is to just limit access to the courts, which, yeah, it's extremely draconian. And I was just wondering how, to what extent do those people threaten this tenuous relationship with the anti-death penalty mm -hmm. economic? This is actually, this is a really, really important point. And this is something that in the book I refer to as tough and cheap. This, because any cost argument can be placed on its head and say, well, we don't want to save this way, but hey, we can save doing all these other things. This tough and cheap mentality is partly why prisons have had all of their rehabilitation programs cut down. Because, you know, we just don't have money to do it. I think it's a very short-sighted way of doing it. Because uh, if we're not investing in rehabilitation programs, people are going to keep coming back and it's going to be expensive. But with the death penalty, the death penalty is actually an excellent example of this. We've seen a successful effort in Florida to streamline the death penalty and get rid of appeals. Or, or to some degree get rid of appeals, uh, which is pretty distressing. And we've seen continuous efforts in California to try to do this, and they haven't been super successful. One of the interesting things along those lines, I just managed to sneak in a paragraph about this just as the book was going to print because it was happening live as I was doing the edit, was what happened in Jones versus Chappelle. Because Jones versus Chappelle is a case in which a judge who's a fairly conservative judge in Orange County says, um, the death penalty is unconstitutional because of the delays. That's the problem. This is, and, and th to me, this is, this is a classic humanitarian argument, right? It's not the death penalty is barbaric, the death penalty is racially discriminatory. Isn't it an interesting example about how the two work together? Because at the end of the day, you said this is a violation of the Eighth Amendment. It tortures somebody to right. be uncertain if they'll ever be executed. Right? Exactly. So there is a kind of human right. consequence to what's ultimately an administrative failing. Absolutely. Although, of course, this suffers from the sort of Olympics of misery problem, right? It's like, what is more miserable? To give you the date of when you're going to die or to just sit there and wonder if you're going to... I mean, I don't know. I, I'm th Thankfully, I don't have the kind of life that, you know, puts me in a place to do this comparison. But it's interesting that um, you're seeing a lot of op-eds from conservative lawmakers that say things like, if it were up to me, the way we would do the savings would, would, would be by just hanging people in the town square. You know, really quickly, with no appeals, with no habeas, this would be cheap and, you know, everything would be great. But I understand that because of the politics in California, because everything is so polarized and, you know, neo-populist here, there's no way that we can push this through. So within the current constraints that we can't get away with, the only rational choice I can support is to abolish the death penalty. And you see this said by conservative lawmakers, including the folks that initiated the 1978 death penalty statute in the first place. So, so but, the, but I think that if advocates are going to kind of take this humanitarianism discourse and try to make headway, and I think that, you know, we haven't, the recession is not far enough in the past that we can't seize the recession and run with it and manage to have nationwide abolition before the economy gets better and people forget. Uh, but I think that, um, I think that one of the things that we need to be, do is be very, very watchful about that kind of argument. And that requires framing this dis discourse in a very tentative way, framing it as a long-term savings plan rather than a short-term savings plan. Sort of explaining to people, yes, you can streamline the death penalty and you can, uh, you can abolish all the rehabilitation programs in prison and you can keep people in, in cells and you know, not provide them any health care whatsoever, but eventually all of this is going to end up being more expensive because all these whores are going to come back to bite you. And this is not something you want to encourage. In the long term, encouraging reentry and rehabilitation and civic engagement is what is going to bring productive people back in the workforce to pay taxes. And, and, and that's the way you should invest it. Of course, this is a more complicated message and one that's more difficult to transmit. It's always easier to you know, slap an electronic monitor or, on, on somebody's leg than uh, send them to school, uh, get to get their GED and, and, you know, and get their drug program. Yes, please. And then over. So this is 
<clears throat> incredibly interesting, uh, but I sort of want to push back a little bit on one of your examples. <coughs> one of the problems when you deinstitutionalize is that you actually get these unintended consequences of net widening. Uh, and your example of the sexual offenders, I think, is actually mm -hmm. a good example of that. I don't think you're necessarily seeing fewer sexual offenders go to prison. You're not seeing them less often going to civil commitment. The folks that are being electronically monitored are the people that would have fell afoul of Megan's law, and they would have had to register, but now is the more effective way to monitor right. them. And the same thing happened with juveniles, you know, when you um, don't send them to um, prison or jail, mm -hmm. uh, and you have diversionary programs, you can widen the net, and so they get stigmatized. And so you actually, by sort of solving one problem of deinstitutionalizing the prisons, you are creating a less draconian alternative, but now you can widen the net right. of the folks that get caught up in this net of mm -hmm. less draconian alternatives. So, so I, I actually completely agree. So, so I, I think that there are things about this that are a lot less salutary, and I think I call this in the book the good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, I, think, I think this is a lot of the ugly, the, the sort of the, the, the creeping sort of uh, way of monitoring people in a way that's less costly. I think that's definitely uh, a serious issue. Here's another take on the same problem. For example, one of the things that I'm talking about in the book is the shift in conversation about the inmate from ward to consumer. So we're not talking so much about, it used to be the case, and those of you who, who have read uh, O. Henry Schultz's short stories probably remember this classic story about Soapy who wanted to go to Rikers for the winter because it gets cold, so he starts committing all these petty offenses in New York in the hope that they're going to throw him to prison. There, there have actually been reported cases in the newspaper uh, since the recession of people who have been trying to do the same because uh, they couldn't get you know, chemo for their cancer or, or, or things like that. And, and one of the things that has shifted is we're moving away from this idea that well, we've sent you to prison, but because you're a ward of the state, we have to provide all your needs and take care of you, to this idea of, well, we don't actually assume any responsibility. You are a customer. You are a burden on the taxpayer. And we're going to see how much you can pay for uh, what it is that you're, you're, you're eating up. So we're, we're seeing a proliferation of uh, pay-to-stay programs where people actually pay for their jail stay. It's, some of you might not know this. In Riverside County, People have to pay $140 a night, $140 a night to the jail for staying in the jail. You can get a really nice hotel in Riverside for less than this. Uh, in Fremont, they're, you, they're telling you, you can go to jail for free, but if you want to be in the jail where you're not going to be beaten up and raped, that's $150 a night. So there's also this bifurcation. So, so, so there's a lot of evils that go with this system, and partly it's this... Uh, this neoliberal retreat of the state from its responsibilities that's actually creating all of this shadow oppressions that are, that are not healthy. I mean, it's interesting, though, that at this moment, and we'll see if Obamacare survives, uh, if it does, it's arguably one of the most significant expansions of state responsibility, and one that, as you point out in the book, is actually potentially fueling a humanitarian mm -hmm. discourse about the expensive and ill-healthed uh, prisoner. Absolutely. You know, you probably get this a lot when you talk places. I get this all the time. When I go and talk about the, you know, the horrors and evils of mass incarceration, there's always somebody in the audience who says, why should they get free health care if I have to pay for it? And I always am put in the position of trying to explain to this person that what people get in prison is not actually health care. I mean, you can call it a lot of things, but, you know, there's nothing there that promotes health in any way. And, and I think that Obamacare actually made a big revolution, particularly for the folks that fail the cost-risk equation, the folks that are old and sick that eat up the lion's share of the expense. So, so I think we had one more back there and maybe one more over here, and that may be it time-wise. Why don't we get those two, and then we'll, we'll open the... Thanks. Uh, with the rise in popularity with um, Orange is the New Black, which I assume you've been watching, um, I wanted to ask about, there seems to be an, uh, um, an open window for talking about gender and women in the prison system, and I wanted to hear what your analysis of that is. So gender is not a salient issue in this particular book. Uh, I've gotten into issues of gender in prison in other things that I've written, and I'm actually in the process of putting together an Orange is the New Black panel for a conference that I'm going to next week, where each of us is going to pick a scene and talk about it. But what, the scene that I've picked, which dovetails with this, is... Um, have you watched season two yet? So season two goes, no spoilers, everybody go like this if you haven't, if you haven't uh, seen. Season two really explores the issue of old and, and infirm inmates. Uh, one of the people featured in season two is a cancer patient, 
and you see her being driven you know, in and out of treatment, and you see a lot of her debacles about how much of this is going to be funded by the prison. So there is some of this pay to stay, inmate as customer thing going on. And the other thing that's going on is you're seeing uh, the older inmates, people, the, people age much faster in, in prison. You're seeing sort of the older generations of, prison, of prisoners banding together and lobbying for rights precisely because they say, well, we're, we're low risk. We're low risk, and 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 you're in, imposing all of these things on us, and and you know perhaps we're no longer really built to spend time with all these young people and all their drama. Uh, part of what has been going on, and I see this largely as a humanitarian move, is uh, when we don't release these folks early to avoid paying their health care bills, we tend to just bunch them together, sort of lump them and isolate them from the rest of the prison uh, community. Not just out of you know a genuine humane, humane concern that these people are going to be victimized, but because, because it's easier to treat them if they're quarantined that way. And the other thing that comes up, and I think this is also discussed briefly in the second season of Orange is the New Black, is what happens to you if you're an old inmate uh, who is sick and gets released, and there's no longer family or friends or no security blanket whatsoever. Nobody cares about you, and and you you're just you're out there, presumably we've done this, you know, humanitarian move and, you know, we've let you go and you're no longer in the clutches of the mass incarceration machine, but nobody cares about you. This is where Obamacare comes into the picture and I'm thankful that it, there, at least there's that piece in place so that, you know, whoever was sick gets, you know, for sure better treatment than they would uh, behind bars. One more over here and I think we'll... I, I really like the comment about the, the inmate as a consumer. I mean, it really, to me, sort of, you go from cost saving, pushing people out to profit making, and, you know, sort of thinking about Alexis Harris's work at Washington, mm -hmm. sort of all the, you know, to be released, you know, from prison. I mean, you go through all these court processes, you pay fines, you do, do all this stuff. I mean, it's sort of the same logic might be driving some of this net widening. So I just wanted to comment on that. But uh, my question is uh, a lot of times as social scientists, we get, enamored with these kind of exogenous shocks to change. And the one here is this 2008 financial mm -hmm. crisis. And sort of oh, out of nowhere, everybody's, everything's unsettled and you know, the ground's shifting as we think about new possibilities. But often when we look at institutional change, the ingredients for those changes are already hidden and laid in, in, in long-term build up slow endogenous change. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if we start from that assumption, if you saw some of those ingredients in the you know, we had in California faced recession twice mm -hmm. in, in two decades before 2008. Um, so we're thinking about that, the court orders, uh, the jail, jail caps, all that stuff. So that's my question. So, so I, think, I think this is a very astute observation. I think that the people that are now trying to capitalize on the cost argument from the left are folks that have been arguing against mass incarceration for years from other perspectives. And they're using this because now it's being affected. And, and the other thing that's important to say is uh, there's people in the room doing all kinds of different work. And lots of people do this micro work where you try to explain only one piece of the puzzle and that's always easier to do. This is more of a macro book. It sort of tries to talk about everything. And each of the pieces here, if you look at it separately, you can provide a particular explanation that is not this exogenous event. Like for example, if you look at the list of states that abolish the death penalty, for the most part, those are states that were not executing a ton of people to begin with. You know, Texas hasn't abolished yet because they're still executing with gusto. A lot of the states that, you know, were willing to get rid of the death penalty were doing it because they weren't doing it before. But that raises the question, well, what now? So maybe this was just this kind of uh, moribund, inst moribund institution for in some of these places. It was, it was dormant. They were, nobody had, you know, any, what it took to get out of the inertia and actually get rid of it. And then this incident comes in and it makes the change. You know, arguments against the war on drugs have been going on all the time. I think the best example of what you're talking about is what happened with three strikes. I mean, in 2012, when Prop 34 didn't pass, Prop 36 did pass. Now, we didn't get rid of, of, of three strikes. That's, we talked about the limitations of humanitarianism. It would have been a good day if we had gotten rid of it completely. Apparently, the politics isn't in place to do that. But we did change it so that it makes more sense, so that the, first, the third felony doesn't, uh, uh, has to be you know, violent or, or serious, which is a big change. So in some ways, if you look at the campaign for Prop 36, it definitely had humanitarian uh, aspects 
to it. I talk about this in, in chapter six of the book. But there were super negative press reports about the application of three strikes for at least a decade before Prop 36 passed. I mean, you would open the newspaper and pretty much all the time you would read stories about how someone in Yolo County stole, you know, $3.99 worth of cheese at Safeway and ends up going to 25 to life. This was going on all the time. I think, and despite the fact that this negative press was trickling in and building, you know, layer, layer above layer, there have been previous efforts to amend three strikes and they were not successful. So maybe what this needed is, you know, this undercurrent of understanding that we've gone too far and that this law doesn't make any sense and it's just, you know, senselessly punitive with this exogenous financial crisis building on top of it, giving it the final push that it needed to pass. Let me give a nice example of that with the, uh, the death penalty example, because there very clearly what you, you rightly attribute to the, the larger framework of new abolitionist thinking, which clearly begins well before, in fact, it begins in the 90s when there's plenty of money around, uh, but it becomes much more effective once the Great Recession mm -hmm. hits. And I think there's something about the Great Recession that does take us to a level of, of state pain that mm -hmm. crosses some kind of threshold or red line or whatever your metaphor is, mm -hmm. a tipping point to uh, get one more in there. Mm -hmm. I think we are about at the end. Uh, so I guess uh, let me uh, ask you to join me in, in thanking Hadar for writing and sharing this great book. Thank Jonathan too. Thank you so much for coming. And I looking at her publisher thing. This is out there in the bookstores now. People can get this or within days, weeks. Hooray! Please buy my book! <laughs>